Now, a lot of the preceding discussion has been based on the idea that the CAPM is the right model uh, to determine the expected return relative to risk of all assets. Uh, but is it actually? Well, in this discussion, we're going to focus on what extensions have been proposed to uh, make this sort of uh, multi-factor asset pricing model more complete than the uh, single factor cap. This is sort of based on the long-standing empirical finding that stocks with high betas actually uh, don't have expected returns that are proportional according to their betas uh, to those of stocks with lower betas. In other words, high beta stocks um, don't actually outperform or well, don't have higher expected returns um, as much as they should. High beta stocks therefore underperform uh, if the CAPM is right uh, relative to low beta stocks, which of course makes one think that the CAPM probably isn't right. Uh, but before we write it off, we should acknowledge uh, that a test of a CAPM is essentially almost unavoidably a joint hypothesis test of two issues. The first that we actually want to test is whether the CAPM is or is not a useful asset pricing model. In other words, uh, if the CAPM is right, if we estimate it correctly, uh, but high beta stocks underperform, well, that means the CAPM is probably not all there is to the story. But that implicitly does test that second part of the hypothesis that we actually implemented the CAPM correctly. Um, and the primary critique to uh, that is whether we measured the market portfolio correctly, but then of course, did we also uh, measure those beta coefficients as well as we possibly could? Remember the OLS uh, proxy, OLS means ordinary least squares here, the regression model that we use to estimate the beta, um, is that actually the right uh, way to estimate it? Did we use uh, the right expected returns? Did we use the right risk-free rate? Did we use the right time horizon? And so on. So any test of the CAPM is essentially a joint test of these two issues. Is the CAPM right? And did we actually implement the CAPM correctly? Um, the most sort of famous objection to test of the CAPM is the uh, critique that actually we should be using the a uh, portfolio of all risky assets, remember, um, not just equities. And most of the times the CAPM is tested on just a portfolio of uh, equity returns, of course, and not even necessarily global equities. Uh, but a true market portfolio might include uh, debt, it might include uh, real assets. In other words, Measuring it is, is really quite hard, and some of these proxies that we use in CAPM tests uh, might fall short, which may actually be what's driving the less than satisfactory performance of the CAPM. Uh, but be it as it may, another strain of literature, uh, most recently exemplified by a paper in 2014 by Frazini and Peterson, uh, suggests that really one reason that the CAPM might not work empirically and high beta stocks might underperform is simply that investors are leverage constrained. Um, that CML does have that kink in it, and therefore in order for them to uh, really borrow when maybe they can't borrow at all, uh, they actually overpay for high beta stocks as sort of a alternative way to get higher leverage, and if they overpay, high beta stocks have uh, than less uh, than their fair expected return. So be that as it may, uh, whether the un underperformance of the CAPM is due to implementation issues or inaccuracies of the CAPM, um, people have found that you can measure expected returns better uh, by accounting for some other factors in addition to the market factor, uh, creating a multi-factor extension of the CAPM. So whereas the CAPM really assumes it's just uh, market risk, that's the one systematic risk factor that explains all uh, movements in, in risk assets, uh, multi-factor generalization of it, uh, very much consistent, by the way, with the APT, which, remember, the arbitrage pricing theory doesn't actually require any single factor. It can work for 
um, any number of potential risk factors. Uh, well, the multi-factor generalization sort of tries to find additional factors that improve the pricing performance of a single factor model. Uh, but that, of course, then leads to the empirical questions of how many factors there might be, um, how we can actually identify them, uh, do they perhaps change over time, um, since there's no theoretical uh, evidence for other factors. Uh, the way that there is for the market factor in the CAPM. Um, really, it is just the EPT approach that then guides uh, multi-factor asset pricing models, which are just identified empirically, um, similar to uh, the index model approach, by simply looking at the cross-section of realized returns and seeing what factors uh, provide additional explanatory power um, besides the market. So a classic one that um, is often discussed is a, a four-factor model that takes essentially a combination of three things. Uh, there's the market factor, uh, same as the, the CAPM. So it essentially nests the CAPM in it. But to it, it adds two other factors proposed by Fama and French in 1992. And these were derived purely by sort of empirical regularity, not uh, really by any sort of theoretical argument. Uh, but Fama and French showed in 1992 that if you also create a macro risk factor based on the returns to small firms minus the returns to large firms, in other words, a sort of long short portfolio uh, that by being long short nets out the effective market factor, uh, but then focuses on this difference in the size characteristic and analogously a long short portfolio on high minus low book to market, in other words, on uh, value that again by being long short nets out market exposures isolating a value component. Uh, that actually better explains the cross section of expected returns and uh, than the CAPM itself does. And this is further augmented by the inclusion of a momentum factor by Carhartt in 1997. So perhaps more accurately, uh, this would be called the Fama French Carhartt four-factor model, but it's often just abbreviated as a Fama French model. Uh, so this is a model then with the CAPM factor in it, but also three additional factors. Um, and we do observe that this explains the cross-section of returns better uh, than just the CAPM does. Uh, now whether, again, this is because these factors are actually uh, important in a way that is uh, uh, theoretically relevant to the, to the pricing of returns, or simply because they make up for some shortcomings in the way that we have estimated the market factor in the CAPM um, is less clear and is still a subject of, of ongoing research. People try to come up with um, equilibrium explanations for these other factors, why they might uh, be priced in theory. Uh, but for now, we certainly observe that they do matter for expected returns in practice from sort of an arbitrage pricing theory perspective. Um, so what are they? Well, that first one, the size factor, essentially is a long short portfolio on small stocks. Uh, in other words, small market cap uh, versus large cap stocks. And this uh, factor has a average positive return. In other words, if it's long small caps and short large caps, on average, the stock or, or this portfolio uh, that represents the size factor earns a positive return. Um, and sort of one theoretical intuition for why this might be is that small stocks perhaps are just more risky than large stocks. 
and therefore any portfolio that has the characteristic of small stocks, um, higher risk, uh, may then earn higher returns uh, because of that portfolio sort of looks like a portfolio of small stocks. It should have a positive beta on the size factor, just as a portfolio that looks like the market um, more and more will have a beta closer to or higher voting on uh, the market factor. Uh, but again, the sort of intuition for risk is there, but mostly this is an empirical regularity. Uh, the value factor, or HML, is again a long short factor on uh, the book to market ratio from uh, fundamental investing, and essentially then that represents the returns to value stocks, those with a high book to market, um, it's long those, and it's short those with a low book to market or growth stocks. And the reason that this might uh, be rationalized to have the positive expected return it often has had, um, though there are times when growth stocks strongly dominate the returns to, to value stocks. Uh, is that, well, perhaps the market just doesn't yet realize the potential of value stocks. The value stocks are underpriced. Uh, their future expected return is therefore higher if they're underpriced, and therefore expected returns should translate into a higher realized returns in the future. Uh, but then, of course, another potential uh, explanation would simply be that value stocks uh, are not mispriced, but just they are riskier. In other words, again, sort of the theoretical underpinnings of the value factor are not clear, uh, but it's empirical contribution to explaining the uh, cross-section of expected returns uh, is strong. And the factor contributed by Carhartt, whereas the prior two were contributed by Fama French in 1992, uh, the momentum factor was uh, described by uh, Carhartt and formally tested in the cross-section of expected returns um, in 1997. This is again a long short portfolio, this time uh, not about a firm uh, fundamental characteristic, uh, but about its trajectory. So this uh, factor is long. Stocks that have done well in the past year, stocks that have gained uh, in price, and a short stocks that have fallen in price over the past year. Um, and again, there isn't really a one consistent theoretical explanation for why uh, momentum actually works. But it's an empirical regularity that it uh, often does. Of course, it then depends on how many uh, market participants are actually trying to trade in a way consistent with the momentum factor. And then indeed, there's actually funds that simply focus on trading each of these individual factors uh, because empirically they're shown to earn positive expected returns. Um, so if momentum becomes potentially a more crowded field, uh, then perhaps uh, at those times the momentum factor may not offer those same expected returns that it uh, does at other times. But uh, there isn't really a consensus yet on what actually explains this behavior, that winners in the past still keep outperforming for uh, a short period in the future, and losers in the past keep underperforming for a short period in the future. Um, but this persistence could be uh, due to sort of some sort of risk characteristic of the stocks or a behavioral characteristic of performance-chasing investors. Um, and therefore the debate is still unsettled, but whether the momentum stocks are actually more risky when they have high momentum than when they have low momentum, or if it is sort of a behavioral explanation, uh, be that as it may, empirically the momentum factor um, is also shown to explain the cross-section of returns in a way that the uh, preceding factors have not. And indeed the sort of story doesn't end there, in addition to the market factor, the size factor, the value and momentum factors, 
Uh, people have considered uh, profitability, quality, um, investment, uh, really because there is not a conclusive theoretical justification for multi-factor models uh, the way that there is for the single factor cap M. Um, there isn't really an explicit threshold for how many factors one should consider, and instead it becomes uh, more of an empirical question. So that's sort of the discussion of risk models both in equilibrium, uh, using the theoretical arguments for, for cap M, and from an arbitrage perspective using the uh, more sort of pricing arbitrage based uh, arguments from the arbitrage pricing theory uh, that can explain uh, some of the commonly used asset pricing models that justify or uh, relate expected returns on individual risk assets relative to uh, their risk on known risk factors. But again, this is a field that is very much still evolving, uh, both on the academic and practitioner sides. Thanks for listening.